Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video, we'll be covering how to maximize muscle growth by organizing training variables into a hierarchy of importance. Let's first establish what exactly we mean by organizing hypertrophy training into a hierarchy. Essentially, a hierarchy shows that certain variables are more important than others to achieve muscle growth. So when we train for hypertrophy, we want to ensure that the most important variables are performed well, and once they are taken care of, we can then worry about the subsequent variables. This also means that we shouldn't get caught up in the details of the least important variables without ensuring the basics are in place. As we can see here, we have a pyramid of variables which are important for hypertrophy training. The factors at the bottom of the pyramid are the most important, and those at the top are less important. We also have two categories of training variables, primary and secondary. The primary variables are proximity to failure, loading and rep ranges, volume and progressive overload. And the secondary variables are exercise selection, frequency and rest periods. Let's now cover each of these variables and explore how they can be implemented to maximize muscle growth. It should be noted that there are other variables that can influence hypertrophy training, although these are the most important variables. Before we get into how training can be manipulated to maximize muscle growth, we first need to cover an underlying factor that needs to be in place for successful muscle growth to occur. The first and most important factor to consider is adherence and consistency. This isn't a training variable that can be programmed and there aren't any special tricks we can do to optimize this. Essentially, trainees need to follow a training protocol that they can consistently stick to for years on end based on their individual lifestyle. A trainee who performs consistent training over time with suboptimal programming will still probably achieve greater hypertrophy than someone who optimizes their training program but cannot stick to it consistently. So before any other variables are considered, we need to ensure that we can actually stick to the training protocol. Let's now discuss the primary training variables for muscle growth. These variables have the biggest impact on hypertrophy. They are also somewhat interrelated, meaning that one impacts the other so they aren't independent from one another. Moving on to our first training variable, we have proximity to failure. Assuming that a trainee can stick to a program consistently, proximity to failure is probably our most important variable. This is ranked as the most important variable because if we don't train hard enough in the first place, then the other variables aren't really gonna have much of an effect. So we need to ensure that we train close enough to failure before considering other training variables. So what does proximity to failure even mean? Proximity to failure simply refers to how many reps from failure a trainee performs a set. When we say failure, we are referring to failure to complete another rep with strict technique. So if a trainee starts swinging or jerking or cuts range of motion, then the set has already been taken to failure. So how close to failure should a set be taken to maximize hypertrophy? Each set should be taken around one to three reps in reserve on average. This is required to stimulate the high threshold motor units so that all muscle fibers are trained. For more information on motor unit recruitment for hypertrophy training, you can watch the video on this channel titled, How Close to Failure Should You Train for Hypertrophy? When we use a lower rep range of around six to 10, sets can be taken around two to three reps from failure, and when using higher rep ranges of 15 to 20, then sets should be taken around one to two reps from failure. Training to complete failure or zero reps in reserve can be performed sometimes, but it shouldn't be performed very frequently. This is because it causes excessive central and local fatigue and can impact performance for following sets and for following training sessions. Training to failure should only be performed at the end of sessions and in small muscle groups like the biceps or calves. So now that we understand training should be taken close enough to failure to train all muscle fibers, we now need to establish what load and rep ranges should be used. Load and reps performed have an inverse relationship. This means that as load increases, the number of reps performed in a given set decreases and vice versa. So if we determine the rep ranges we want to train in and know that we need to take sets one to three reps from failure, we can adjust the load to fit this criteria. For muscle growth, it seems that the best range to work in is around six to 20 reps. We don't want to train in the one to five rep range since this doesn't provide enough reps to fully fatigue the muscle fibers. And we don't want to use rep ranges too high as very light loads simply don't provide enough mechanical tension for optimal muscle growth. The next most important variable for hypertrophy training is volume. 
This is arguably the most important variable as it has the strongest correlation with hypertrophy. This is true, although we need to ensure volume is performed with the appropriate proximity to failure and the appropriate rep range. Otherwise, we could be doing lots of volume, but with very low effort and very low rep ranges, which won't be ideal for muscle growth, no matter how much volume we do. Volume refers to the number of sets performed per muscle group per week. For example, if we perform four sets of pull-ups and four sets of rows twice per week, we accumulate a total of 16 sets for the back throughout the week. The volume hypertrophy relationship probably follows an inverted U shape. This means that more volume results in more muscle growth up until a point. Once we reach this point, we can't fully recover from the training we are performing and hypertrophy trains aren't as good. And if we do extreme levels of volume, we may actually see no muscle growth at all. So how do we know how much volume to perform? Well, if the trainee feels well recovered from training, has no lingering joint issues, they can experiment with a higher volume for that particular muscle group. If a trainee is performing fairly high volumes already and feels some new joint irritations or they are seeing negative results in performance, then they may be performing too much volume and will see better at hypertrophy with slightly lower volumes. Here is a general guide of how much volume is a good place to start for each major muscle group for most intermediate trainees. You can play around with the volume within these ranges and adjust training based on your individual response. The next factor in the hypertrophy hierarchy is progressive overload. Progressive overload refers to making training harder over time. For hypertrophy training, this means performing more weight or more reps in the 6 to 20 rep range over time. Now, progressive overload is a very grey subject for hypertrophy training. We don't necessarily need to apply progressive overload in a program, but we need to ensure training is stimulative enough for progressive overload to occur. So progressive overload can be seen more so as a result of training rather than the driver of hypertrophy. What this means is that if training is taken close enough to failure, we are working in the appropriate rep range and we are performing the right amount of volume, then we should naturally see improvements in performance over time. So our performance can be used as a proxy for muscle growth. Trainees shouldn't expect week to week progression every single week unless they are new to training, but month to month and year to year progression should be seen. If performance progress isn't being made, then you may have to go back to the previous three variables and change something to make training more effective. Now we are getting to the more minute details of hypertrophy training. These variables can impact muscle growth, but not to a significant extent. We can think of these variables as making sure we don't do them wrong rather than striving to do them perfectly. The first of the secondary variables is exercise selection. Simply put, we want to make sure the exercises chosen are effective at targeting the muscle group we are trying to grow. There are many different exercises that can be performed for each muscle group, and some are better than others. We generally want to use exercises which have the best stimulus to fatigue ratio. This refers to exercises that give us the most hypertrophy stimulus for a muscle group with the least systemic fatigue. For example, let's compare a conventional deadlift with a stiff leg deadlift. A conventional deadlift trains the glutes and hamstrings, but also involves many other muscle groups and is quite taxing on the nervous system. A stiff leg deadlift, on the other hand, trains the glutes and hamstrings through a larger range of motion using less load. This means that a trainee will probably get greater hamstring and glute growth from stiff leg deadlifts and less systemic fatigue. In other words, the stiff leg deadlift probably has a better stimulus to fatigue ratio. The next training variable in this category is frequency. Frequency refers to how many times per week a muscle group is trained. Frequency itself doesn't seem to have much of an impact on hypertrophy, rather it is simply a way to distribute volume. For example, a trainee will see similar hypertrophy outcomes if they perform 4 sets of chest training 3 times per week, or 6 sets of chest training 2 times per week. Since the total amount of volume is equated, the hypertrophy response will be essentially the same. However, it seems that higher frequencies allow exercises to be performed with greater quality, which may have a slightly beneficial effect. So generally speaking, training a muscle group more than once per week may be slightly more effective than only training it once per week, even with the same volume. So a practical recommendation will be to train each muscle group around two to four times per week. Smaller muscles can probably be trained with higher frequencies and larger muscles are probably better suited to lower frequencies. And the last variable we will discuss is rest periods. This refers to how much rest is taken between each set. There is no exact duration of rest time that is universally ideal, 
Rather, we want to rest long enough so that the muscles become the limiting factor of the exercise rather than central fatigue. We don't want the cardiovascular system or nervous system to inhibit performance. A good example of this is during multiple sets of back squats. After a tough set of squats, the trainee is probably breathing fairly hard and the legs are probably feeling slightly lethargic. We want to ensure that the trainee rests long enough to catch their breath, let their heart rate come down and regain good neuromuscular control of their legs. Otherwise, these factors may limit performance in the next set rather than the leg muscles being the limiting factor. A practical takeaway is to rest long enough until the trainee is ready to perform the next set with 100% effort. This will probably be longer for compound lifts and shorter for isolation exercises. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.